Good morning to everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, I I can hear you. Oh, thank I you. Hear you. Thank, yeah. Thank you. Good morning to everyone. And uh, uh, please, uh, Julie, could you start the session? Okay, good morning to, to everyone and, and good afternoon to some of you who are in the other side of the planet uh, and following us. Welcome to this session, co-designing the ocean signs we need for Western Tropical Atlantic that is convened by the Intermetal Oceanographic Commission of UNESCO Sub Commission for the Caribbean and Adjacent Regions, Ayo Caribe. As part of the Ocean Decade virtual series with the support of the Swedish Ministry uh, for Environment. My name is Cesar Toro. I am the head of the IOC of UNESCO's Regional Secretariat for IO Caribe. And uh, I, uh, we have, as we, uh, we speak, we have uh, uh, reached 271 people who registered to this session and we have over 103 people, over 100 people already connected. So people are going, uh, uh, are going to uh, join us as we speak. So uh, I would like just to introduce a few uh, uh, housekeeping items. First of all, uh, is uh, we have a, 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 I would like just to introduce a few uh, housekeeping. So I, I would like to mention to all of you that the, this uh, session is being recorded. I just started the recording of the mission of the, of the session. And uh, a, a link to access the recording will be shared on, on the decade dedicated web page. And uh, uh, you, uh, the session is organized around two substantive segments and involves moderated interactive discussion. So the panelists will be asked to switch on or off their cameras and mic prior and after the presentations. So please try to limit to talk to the minutes you have been given. It's extremely important. We have a very tight uh, agenda today. So please bear in mind that you have the time that is uh, allotted to you, please uh, use it in the best manner. And uh, uh, also to all the participants, I, I would like to encourage you to write down your questions, comments, etc., in the chat or in the panel that is dedicated to questions and, and, and answers. And uh, uh, the session will be uh, moderated by uh, our colleague, uh, Elva Escobar, who is a, a professor at the uh, National University of Mexico or Universidad Nacional Autónoma de Mexico. And uh, uh, the bios of all the uh, participants will be available in our uh, uh, and part uh, of the speakers and panelists will be available in the uh, decade series webpage. So without further ado, I would like to uh, welcome all of you again and uh, uh, give the floor to open the floor to Elva. So Elva, please, the floor is yours. So please, next, uh, uh, two next, uh, uh, well, Elva, please uh, uh, start with the agenda. Thank you, Elva. Thank you, Cesar. Good morning, everyone. I am Elva Escobar, and I will be your moderator. I have been introduced, so I'll just jump that. Uh, we are very glad that you joined us today for the co-designing, the science we need for the ocean decade, needs challenges and opportunities in the Western Tropical Atlantic virtual session. This is a virtual dialogue at the regional level. 
It seeks to explore opportunities and challenges, discuss the best practices, the lessons learned, and identify recommendations, including those with respect to regional specificities for the ocean community, looking to deliver transformative decade actions for long lasting benefits to the ocean and society. The dialogue intends to guide stakeholders and scientists in the co-design of programs that can be submitted in response to the call for action while setting the stage for the ocean decade. The expected output of the virtual dialogue will be a short regional discussion paper that will include clear recommendations and guidance for a decade partners, the decade governance and the coordination structures on the ways in which the fundamental barriers and issues can be addressed. The discussion paper will be prepared in close collaboration with the co-conveners and the regional session with the support of a regional consultant. This regional virtual session is structured in three parts to explore the co-design concept, to identify the main challenges and opportunities at regional level for co-design and to discuss capacity development and resource needs at the regional level, both in terms of academic outputs and in the terms of formal and informal training activities for non-academic partners, including best practices. We have a tight schedule and a challenging program to cover. So let us start. And I welcome Arnulfo Sanchez, who is the chair of Yo Caribe, to give us the welcome words. Eh, buenos días, ¿me escuchan? Escuchamos bien. Gracias, Arnulfo. Sí, buenos días, estimados colegas. Gracias por su asistencia a esta segunda sesión virtual de trabajo del diseño de las Naciones Unidas para la Ciencia Oceánica para el Desarrollo Sostenible 2021-2030. Esta sesión aprovechará y estimulará la investigación oceánica innovadora, profundizará en factores contextuales del Atlántico Tropical Occidental, junto con prioridades a nivel regional en términos de transformación de los sistemas de conocimiento, desarrollo de capacidad y mejora de la formación de la educación, la cual fortalecerá la cooperación de muchas partes interesadas necesarias para desarrollar la ciencia que necesitamos para el océano que queremos. El diseño proporcionará un marco para la, para la investigación oceánica colaborativa y participativa. Apoyará una mejor integración de diversos sistemas de conocimiento de diferentes disciplinas científicas y comunidades oceánicas. Con esto le doy la bienvenida a todos a este panel, a esta segunda sesión. Bienvenidos sean todos. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Um... And, um, and, for, and I will uh, welcome Craig McLean, who is the Assistant Administrator for the NOAA Research and member of the Executive Planning Group of the UN Decade. And he will be talking to us today about the transformative nature of the UN Decade of the Ocean Science for Sustainable Development 2021 mm -hmm. to 2030 and the call for actions. Welcome, Craig. Muchas gracias, Elba. Thank you all very much for the invitation and the opportunity. And I'm honored to be speaking to you and recognize that Elva herself, Krista von Hildebrandt, who will be speaking shortly, and many of our executive planning group members could easily be presenting this summary. I want to inspire you and thank also with Cesar and Arnulfo, and also my colleague, Art Patterson, who represents the US in Ayo Carib. But thank you all for the opportunity and thank you for the inspiration. It's very important that we realize that what's in front of us is a once in a lifetime opportunity, I truly believe, where the oceans will be in front of all of our society for opportunities for us to make great gains. And those gains must be transformative. We must be taking to heart the opportunity to be thinking differently and acting towards the outcome of the science that we want to perform and identify. And that is where co-design and the purpose of this meeting really comes to play. Co-design is important. We are not just developing scientific concepts and activities. I hope you can really see the opportunity to be developing science that delivers a societal outcome that benefits our people. And the Caribbean and Western Atlantic is an area that's very important to me. As a retired ship captain and diver, I have sailed and worked in the waters of this region for most of my life with great enjoyment and great respect for the people and the environment. So may I have the next slide, please? 
the world is changing in front of us, and I need not spend much time describing these indicators of how fast the world is indeed changing. We recognize that, we know that climate change is real, and it is happening around us with the types of impact that will change our environment and is changing our environment at a rate far faster and to certain points that humans have not lived on this earth with the level of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere and other attributes. We're changing the world quickly. We need to do something about it. Next slide, please. We can see from this image that is academically prepared on a relative scale of human impact. And you could note in the Western Atlantic and Caribbean region, in the coastal areas, we have in the higher red colors, some indicators of human impact that is quite substantial in changing the ocean and its natural environment. That has consequences, we know that. We also have economies in our society that are developing in many of the regions where these ocean impacts are registered and scored. Next slide, please. So in order to address that problem, the Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission had constituted the development of a UN decade of ocean science for sustainable development. The United Nations approved this in 2017, and we prepared with the IOC staff an implementation plan, which is now available, and I hope you have had a chance to see it. And that was now providing us an opportunity for people around the world to respond to a call to action, which was issued in October of this past month, October 15th, inviting submissions from all people and all players. And we certainly look forward to seeing the submissions from the Caribbean and Western Atlantic tropical regions. Next slide, please. In producing the, the science for the ocean we want, there are many subjects that will be apparent to us. You can look at these 10 subjects and realize that many of the international meetings that we have all attended over the past five to 10 years or longer have been recognizing these as challenges in front of us, but in co-design and in transformative and transformational science, I ask you to be thinking of what are the deliverables necessary in order to solve these issues and these challenges and what science will we need to generate in order to get on top of these and make the changes that are necessary to benefit societies. In particular, I would highlight particularly for the region, an observing system, a digital map, capacity development, and what are the barriers to our society's change and how can we deliver science-based information that helps that end product, the goal of the science, the societal enhancement and benefit that we seek to achieve. Next slide, please. The decade has generated several, in fact, seven societal outcomes. I hope you are familiar with them. And the next three slides will demonstrate the subject of that societal outcome. And on the right hand side, you can see the sustainable development goals of the United Nations for 2030 and how our activity will be advancing these. So if you look at the first three and the, now the second three as we have here. Okay, thank you. The clean ocean speaks for itself. We need to reduce pollution. For a healthy and resilient ocean gives us the opportunity to enhance the productivity of ecosystems, to protect them and manage them as appropriate. A productive ocean is to make sure that we can feed people and we have a sustainable supply of protein and a sustainable ecosystem that can provide such to the public. Next slide, please. In looking at a predicted ocean, we want to be able to measure and monitor and then make forecasts of the health of the ocean. We do so now, but not with the completeness that we seek to achieve. A safe ocean to protect the people who live on, around, and work in and on the ocean from the types of hazards of tsunami or tropical cyclones, which our region is very familiar with. An accessible ocean, making the data and the information readily available to the people who need it to be making decisions that benefit society. Next slide, please. The one that I'm the most charmed with and the one that I think really resonates with many people who live in the region is that the ocean is inspiring and it is engaging to humans. We love being near the ocean and there's a sense of wellness and enrichment and we need to stimulate people to see this and appreciate it. Next slide, please.
with these societal outcomes in mind and with co-design in mind, it's very important for us to realize that the science we need to deliver the ocean we want has to engage many additional constituencies. This is not simply a scientist's gathering to determine what science we would like to pursue to have a greater understanding of the ocean. Please remember, it's the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development. So if we look at these constituencies, they and others need to be involved in the co-design so we can identify the societal challenge we face, produce the science that answers the unknowns or gives further information as to why a particular course of action is so important in order to achieve that societal outcome. So there is much opportunity for us and there is much work for us. Next slide, please. As we look now for the opportunities in front of us, the IOC has produced a call for programs and contributions. That was the October 15th call that I mentioned. And the submission requested is by January 15th of large scale ideas, perhaps regional for your region, our region, perhaps local, but looking at large programs for the first call and the opportunity to make contributions to the needs here. I think that the IOC will be very capable of assisting us with a wide network of participating nations, 150 nations, of putting the oceans front and center in our view so that we know we have the opportunity. And if we don't take that opportunity now, I would say it's a shame for us to have missed it. But if not now, when will we do the things that you and I know are very important for ocean science in its understanding to be able to relate to the citizens, the communities, the governments, and the concerned folks that live in the region, because the oceans have an impact globally. We know that. The more we can do here in this decade, the more we'll be able to produce the benefits and through co-design, through co-development, the transformative nature of science being able to take our world from the way we know it today, which based on the first graphs I showed you is a concerning future forecast for us and change that outcome to a more robust and, and beneficial life for our grandchildren. There will be a kickoff event in Germany in May 2021 to start the decade. And this call for programs gives an opportunity to recognize after receiving these submissions and recognize the work agenda for the decade. So we have a lot of work to do. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity, and I'm very pleased to be sharing it with you. And I look forward to great and imaginative contributions. Thank you very much. Let's go. Thank you very much, Craig. This is fantastic. I would like to comment to all our participants that we sent the poll, the first poll, asking which sector do you represent and have had so far a response of 85% 85, 85 of the votes from all the participants. Uh, we, you are sharing now our, in the screen the results of this, the voting, and we can notice that 48% of the people participating is in the academia, followed by people working in the government, 13% um, people working for NGO, uh, OG, NGOs, and um, followed by industry and regional international organizations. Thank you very much for participating. And we will move on now to our second um, set of talks and um, we will hear from Krista von, von Hildebrand Andrade, Manager, Caribbean Tsunami Warning Program, member of the executive, executive planning group of the UN Decade. And she will present us an overview and outcomes of the Western Tropical Atlantic meeting and the first global session on co-design. Thank you, Krista. You have the floor. Well, good day and thank you very much. Um, and I really appreciate the opportunity to provide an update um, on both our first regional um, meeting and on the global meeting on co-design. Um, to all the participants and speakers, we really appreciate the time that you take to attend this event and become part of what we also like to call the Ocean Science Revolution. To the IOC and the government of Sweden, thank you for bringing us all together. Next.
So on the 28th to the 29th of April, um, the Western Tropical Atlantic met um, for the first time to discuss the decade as a group. Um, it was our first regional planning meeting. Originally, this meeting was supposed to be held in Mexico, but due to the COVID-19 situation and the pandemic, it was not possible to have an in-person meeting, and therefore we switched to a virtual format. And while we were expecting 100 and around 100 people in Mexico, the virtual meeting um, permitted us to engage over 500 people and um, many of these people representing um, the sectors of, of the academia like we have today and from national institutions also similar today. And we had a good engagement of the NGOs and other members of our ocean science community and um, other regional institutions. We had a good gender balance. And um, also we noted that we had in terms of age, we were very um, encouraged by the strong participation of our youth early career ocean professionals, and our mid-career ocean professionals. And this is very important because they will be the ones that can participate in the decade and they will also be participating way beyond the decade. So the decade and our actions and our activities and the programs that we develop won't stop there. So it's good that those that will be taking the decade forward are here at day one um, with us. And we all agreed and acknowledged, while there remains many gaps in ocean science, understanding, and data, the, really the current state of the knowledge should have been enough to stop the accelerated decline in ocean health, productivity, and safety. Therefore, central to our actions is the notion, as Craig mentioned, transformation. So in the following slides, I'd like to take a look at where we saw the opportunities for grand action within the outcomes that um, um, Craig um, outlined earlier in his presentation. So within a clean ocean um, decade, we discussed um, the importance to improve the understanding, but the, that understanding had to be improved through a harmonized and region-wide data collection and analysis and research program, and see the flow and impacts of all pollutants in the Western tropical Atlantic, our ocean, and transform decision-making facilitating targeted pollution preventive measures to sustain and catalyze more sustainable use of our coastal and marine resources. Then we moved on to a healthy and religious or, or, and a resilient ocean. And there we see the notion of capacity to understand, map, and protect these marine and coastal ecosystems. And once again, at the regional scale through science and informed strategies to manage marine stressors including human activity at multiple scales and that role in changing climate. Um, then we moved on to sustainably and harvested productive ocean. And there it was emphasized and that concept of co-design came out very, very strongly where we had to have these transboundary, multidisciplinary and, and cross-sectoral approaches in research, but also engaging all the different sectors. And who and is this relevant for and who are services to be provided and the relevance is for livelihoods, economic and social development. In the next slide, we can appreciate the other um, areas of outcome and these grand actions. So in a predicted ocean, once again, that focus on data, observations, um, on a sustainable and a long term, and to um, including those human interactions and deliver forecast and decision support tools. So that's our deliverable. In Safe Ocean, we also see that deliverable of this decision and support tools, but in within the context of a regional multi-hazard um, um, framework, which is linked to education, outreach, readiness, and communication actions that empower and recognize the national and local policies. So although we work at a regional level, the, the need to um, go dive into the national, have those applications at that national and local level. And also the individual response. So, so we talk about um, the behavioral change that is needed for the protection of life um, and lives and livelihoods. In accessible develop, um, ocean, we also see that capacity element um, surfacing um, once again on the information access system for data sharing and interoperability. And that data has to be available 
also to the public for specific products and services. So once again, services tailored so that they are relevant to the different stakeholder needs with feasible standardization and best practices. Next. So then um, we had, after this, we also discussed the cross-cutting priorities in the coordinated strategy to address capacity development, which we'll be talking forward. The involvement and the role of, of young ocean professionals is important for them and they are critical for the decade. Traditional and local knowledge, that reconnection to the ocean, which led also to that seventh um, outcome on engaging an inspirational ocean. So empowering people from a bottom-up approach and that blue sector, the blue economy with a focus on tourism and fisheries. Next. So then we had um, on September 24th, we had our first global meeting on that discussed um, co-design and within conditions it highlighted the need for funding infrastructure and policy support within partnerships, not only the regional coordination, but also the regional exchange and the dialogue. And that had to be based on also trust. And also we would say in the Western tropical Atlantic, we had to deliver with passion. So moving forward, we have to, we have our IO Carib serving as a secretariat. We have um, the establishment of a regional planning group. And then also we've established, as you can see on the next slide, are different working groups for the seven outcomes. So the seven outcomes are outlined here and we've already discussed. So for many of us, the terms of concept of co-design and co-construction and co-production and co-delivery may be new. Therefore, it's only logical that our regional and thematic decade workshops would follow up with this um, global and regional, uh, regional virtual series. I'm truly looking forward to learning from experts and seasoned practitioners on the best approach and experience on co-design solution-oriented research that will lead to this transformative decade. Given the devastating impact of COVID-19 on lives and livelihoods around the globe, this transformation of the way we view and conduct the ocean science is all the more relevant and imperative. If we truly want to obtain different results, we're going to have to try different approaches because paraphrasing Albert Einstein, we can, can't expect different results if we keep doing things over and over again the same way. This would be insane. So let's move on to our next um, part of our session today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christia. Thank you for this important information. It sets the background to our session. And we will now start with part one which is what is co-design and how to use co-design as a framework for decade actions in the region. Um, we'll have the first speaker, Maria Concepcion Donoso from Florida International University, director of the international programs of UNESCO and chair of sustainable water security. She will present us an introduction on co-design, co-production and co-delivery. Thank you. Welcome Maria Concepcion Donoso. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, Elba, and thank you, IOC, in particular, IO Carib, and um, the, the partners in organizing this event for inviting me to be uh, a speaker in this very interesting um, webinar. Uh, I, I will, um, first slide, please. First, um, next, thank you. Um, I will talk of co-design co-production and co-delivery. But before we get into it, um, let me just say that this is not really a concept that it's new, um, but um, the, the issue is that it needs to be widely adopted um, to attain the ocean that we want. Um, those of you that have been successful in advancing scientific research, which positively contributes to respond the needs of communities and brings together scientists from multiple disciplines working with stakeholders at different levels, and um, during various stages of your work, um, you will be taking into account the particularities of the local culture, environmental setting, and aim to improve the quality of life of all, that is not leaving anyone behind, then you have been implementing co-design, co-production, and co-delivery in an interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary um, setting. So as you can see, 
Um, in many occasions, this is a, a methodology that we apply, but it needs to be applied in a broader sense by the scientific community and all other stakeholders. So let's start very briefly uh, reminding ourselves what is co-design, uh, which consists of a participatory development of research projects with stakeholders, including in some cases, potential users of the results of this science. Um, the objective is definitely to define what are the questions that we have to answer as scientists, um, that is respond to specific sustainability and development needs. And also uh, we need to make sure that our research corresponds to the stakeholders collective and targeted interest. Um, and by this, it is important to sometimes um, make sure that we also target in, uh, interests that are not of the collective. For example, we may need to um, target small groups that of indigenous populations, um, and this is okay too. So it's collective and targeted interest. Um, next one, please. Co-production consists then of a participatory development and implementation of research project with stakeholders. So this is a, a, a process in which not only the scientists get together, but stakeholders are involved from the very beginning at different levels in different capacity, but um, they are brought into the picture. And by stakeholder, we mean a wide uh, concept of um, people that are interested or involved or are, are living in the areas where we are implementing or where our research is targeted. The objective here is to create relevant, useful, and usable information and also knowledge to create and deliver sustainable um, solution which responds to the need of the parties and advance sustainable development. So this uh, part of um, advanced sustainable development should always be present in this process. Next one, please. Co-delivery then is, consists of a participatory development of strategies for three things. First, appropriate root use of research. Second, establishing knowledge sharing and data platform. Um, the results and the information that is produced or that is gathered during the uh, research process should be shared uh, to um, all stakeholders. And then reaching out to communities, industries, other um, um, scientists, governments, NGOs, etc. And also, as indicated earlier, to current or potential user. And if we contextualize these process within today's um, world, uh, we should contribute to advance the sustainable development agenda or um, agenda 2030, as uh, was indicated by speakers that preceded me. Next one, please. Now, um, in during co-design, co, -design, co production and co-delivery, um, we must involve two concepts, interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity. Now, from a, a, a purely linguistic perspective, these two uh, concepts or these two words have been used indistinctively. The way it's presented now, it's, it's important to um, indicate that there, 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 there is a, a difference in terms of the objectives of interdisciplinarity and transdisciplinarity within the process of co-design, co-production, and co-delivery. On the one hand, interdisciplinary involves um, making scientists come together in the research. So it has to be a multiple discipline of scientists participating. And when we say this, um, we just not refer only to natural science and social science, which is the way it appears in some of the literature. We have to include the hard science, that is physics, mathematics, um, um, also economic sciences, etc. Uh, on the one hand, so this is interdisciplinarity. In terms of transdisciplinarity, 
it means that we need to involve also multiple stakeholders, that is policymakers, um, NGOs, uh, uh, private sector, et cetera. And, um, and uh, this has to be throughout the process, throughout the uh, process of co-design, co-production, and co-delivery, and in different stages. Um, the next one, please. Now, when we involve um, stakeholders or actors, or more so when actors and stakeholders are involved in this process, we, we need to keep in mind a, a number of issues. First of all, that each group of stakeholders must play a particular role, which is um, related to who they are and what they do. So for example, we cannot expect that the um, fishermen of Yucatan will be involved in the labs of Florida International U University doing tests on the various species in their area. But we do need to be uh, aware and involved them in trying to identify which species have been more affected, say, by hurricanes or by uh, water pollution, etc. And um, so at the initial stage of co-design, um, they are definitely a most important partner in developing or, ans or uh, putting together the questions that we're going to answer at, in our research. Um, could, you, could you go back to, to the uh, previous one? Um, I just want to make one more point there. Hello? Oh, never mind. Um, the, the other uh, aspect is that they need to be uh, playing different roles, and these roles can be at different stages. We have to make sure that they are having um, a, a well-defined um, participation um, and not to create expectations. And we need to make sure that everybody is involved. Like when we saw our survey, we saw, for example, that um, we had a number of people at the government, but none of them, not, uh, very few defined themselves as policymakers. And it is important to have policymakers. So um, when we apply or uh, where we introduce the process of co-design, co-production, and co-delivery in a region as, um, as varied as the TWA, we need to include other aspects into consideration. Uh, first of all, societal issues, uh, the societies um, in the Caribbean islands that are dedicated to tourism, different than the societies in some of the um, I, uh, um, countries that are in the continent that are more uh, fishermen oriented or um, other type of, ac of activity. The culture, we have a, a very um, wide culture, uh, uh, throughout the region, um, from indigenous populations to very um, uh, modernized, uh, industrial-driven um, areas. Scientific knowledge is definitely not the same throughout the region, um, and we need to make sure that whatever research we do will support that to go, uh, bridge the gap between the scientific community in different parts of the region. Economics um, needs to be considered, especially in this period after the COVID-19. Um, the environment, although from a climatic perspective, there we are within a, a, a range of the tropics, but the environmental differences um, in the region are, are quite different. And of course, geopolitical aspects, which are also uh, quite diverse. And um, in this aspect of bringing everybody together, um, to design um, the adequate research to respond and to uh, attain the ocean we want um, must include um, the working with uh, uh, people coming from different um, uh, backgrounds, uh, at different societies, different um, in entities, and of course, what joins us is our seas, our ocean. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Maria Duno. So I think this was a great presentation and it helped us to better understand what co-design, co-production and co-delivery are. I invite now our audience to see the poll number two 
uh, please let us know through the chat if you have problems visualizing it and it will remain for five minutes. Um, and in the meantime, I will be presenting you our, um, our next um, set, uh, a set of uh, questions and answers that we, will receive, that we have received through the chat. Um, so we have a comment here from Nayate Barbosa from Lima Reis, and this is for the panelists. Uh, he says, hi from Brazil, this point is very important. Inter and in in transdisciplinary, in my perspective, is also important to provoke discussion about other cultures, the different meanings of the ocean and the importance of the ecology of knowledge. For the young researchers and specialists involved in the oceanic science, it is necessary to reinforce the need for an epistemological perspective of complexity, which goes beyond the dichotomous view of which only one teaches and the other only learns. We need to overcome the barriers between the humanities and the biological and exact sciences through interdisciplinarity and include traditional knowledge through transdisciplinarity. This is our only comment that we have received so far. And I wonder whether Maria would like to make a comment on this. Um, yes, thank you very much. Um, this is a, an important uh, item to bring uh, forward in our discussions is, is the, uh, the, the fact that culture is a key when we involve uh, various stakeholders. Uh, like I said earlier, the, the, the natural or environmental setting could be quite um, similar, but uh, culturally it could be quite different when we're dealing with a community um, in the Wajira in Colombia or a uh, community in uh, Jamaica in the sector where they, we have the resorts. Um, so um, the, the culture, the, the, the language and, and the objectives of, or, and that pursue these various groups is different. Um, and it definitely, uh, it needs to be taken into consideration and it needs to be an, uh, a very important part uh, from the very beginning, from the co-design, through the co-production, and to uh, um, at the end when, when we uh, attain co-delivery. Thank you very much. Um, just going back to the poll, just to remind you, we have the poll open for voting. And the question is, what is your experience with co-design? We had 65% um, of the people voting and most of these um, votes were in the range of medium experience. Um, Isabel reinitiated it, it, so we have a lower voting right now. But so we will move on now. At, well, thank you, Maria Donoso, and we will move on to the part number one, which is. Um, uh, we will continue with uh, part number two, which is main challenges and opportunities for co-design, co-produced and co-deliverance science, regional case studies. And we have invited two panelists to speak about the theme. We will have the first presentation by Robin Mahan. He works for the Center of Resource Management and Environmental Studies, the CERMIS, at the University of the West Indies. In, cave, in the Cave Hill campus in Barbados. He will be presenting the UNIP GAP um, Caribbean Large Marine Ecosystem, CLME. Thank you, Robin, welcome. You have the floor. Thank you very much, Elba, and good day to everybody. It's wonderful to be with you, and I really thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to talk about this very important program can we have the next slide and move through that, which is the title slide to the second slide, please. Next slide. Okay, just to remind everybody of the, oh, next one, please go back up. The four questions that we were invited to address here is how the science program was developed, the challenges that we experienced, and how they were resolved, the benefits to science, and how did that impact public policy and behavioral change? And I'm gonna try and 
I'll work my way through those. Next slide, please. I don't really need with this group to emphasize the importance of ocean and coastal ecosystems. Uh, but it was my only opportunity to put up a few pretty pictures because most of what I'm going to talk about is policy and institutions. So next slide, please. Okay, the first question is how was the program developed and the process used to bring the multi transdisciplinary group together and generate cross trust and a common vocabulary. And I'm speaking about the Caribbean Sea Large Marine Ecosystem and I'm calling it initiative. Next slide, please. I call it initiative um, because it comprised several phases, four in fact. It encompasses the Caribbean and North Brazil shelf LMEs, which you can see there over to the right of the little map that we have there. And it started out back in 1998 uh, and went through to 2008, 10 years with two development phases. It took 10 years to get it developed before it moved into the full phases, which went from 2009 to 2013 as the CLME project and 2015 to 2021, we're just coming up to the end of the second full phase next year. The foundation of this uh, initiative, uh, and it's going to continue, we hope, in after next year as, as a further five-year period, is the, pro the, the GEF uh, process, International Waters Program process of transboundary diagnostic analyses uh, which are very science-based and use existing science and information to determine what the problems are. And then it moves on to the strategic action program, which is a plan or program that is a roadmap for improved ocean governance. And we developed this in the, or the project developed this in the 20, 2009 to 2013 phase of the project. And it was signed at the ministerial level by 25 countries and then moved on into the first phase of implementation in 2015 uh, through to the present. And this uh, program engages all countries and all reg regional organizations. The focus is very much at the regional level. Next slide, please. The SAP comprises a number of strategies. And the first major group is about strengthening regional level governance. And that's where I'm going to focus attention here. But there is also pilot projects to uh, work on ecosystem approach to key ecosystem types, which you see there, reefs, pelagic ecosystem, and the North Brazil shelf ecosystem. And all of these are intended to be science-based, as you would imagine, <clears throat> in order to take an ecosystem approach. And the SAP is not intended to do everything. It's meant to be an umbrella that ties together a lot of other programs and activities within the region and gives them some level of cohesion. Next slide, please. Well, as you can imagine in a program of that size, uh, there were many challenges as you would have with, with any large project. And so it's not really possible to give full details here. Uh, what I will do is look quickly at some of the overall challenges and then zero in on one that I think is particularly relevant to this ocean science decade. Two major challenges is sustained engagement of IGOs that were all part of it because all of the regional IGOs were involved in, in this project and they all have their own agendas and programs to work on. So the sustained engagement of them was a challenge, but even more so sustained engagement of countries in a regional level project where they may not see exactly what the, um, the benefits are right away, a bit of a longer term project. And what we found was useful in addressing this, these challenges was the development of a conceptual basis, a multi-level governance framework based on policy process uh, or policy cycle, which you can see there, a classic one. Uh, and I won't read all of those. Most of you will be familiar with the parts of such a, a process. 
and the recognition that it is necessary to have such processes going on at all levels, from local to global, and that these need to be linked. And when people got into that concept, they realized that their particular aspect or concern or area of operation was going to be considered, if not focused on, then we were able to proceed and work together in a much more uh, constructive way. Next slide, please. Okay, so what were some of the major benefits? Question, the next question. Um, the production of a regional level governance framework and the, and the SAP that I mentioned for transboundary ocean governance in the wider Caribbean region was a, a first, a new product that tied uh, initiatives at the regional level together. And in doing that, there was a lot of experience generated among partners at working together in working together at the regional level, uh, both countries and the IGOs and the other organizations, non-governmental, such as the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute that take part, have, that took part in this initiative. And one of the main products that we are close to, but not quite finished with, is the Regional Coordination Mechanism for Transboundary Ocean Governance in the wider Caribbean region, which, dare I say, we expect to be implemented during the next phase of this project. So th there are some other benefits too, and this is where I'm going to zero in, in the pilot projects, progress in learning by doing with the several uh, types of fisheries that I mentioned earlier. And this is what I'm going to focus on for the rest of the talk is better understanding of the science policy interfaces and needs in the region. Next slide, please. Okay, so how did we change public policy and behavioral science? We did develop this better understanding and we did that through some field research, which was published in the paper in Frontiers to the bottom left there. And also some conceptual development around science and policy, which you can find in this 2020 report from Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute on how science uh, or science and research and, and science policy agenda for the region in the, in the remainder of the strategic action program period. Next slide, please. Okay, so the way that we looked at science policy interfaces was to deconstruct them somewhat according to this um, policy cycle that I spoke of earlier into science providers and science consumers. And from among providers we have national government scientists, regional intergovernmental organizations, academia, NGOs, and community um, generators of science. And we have all the types that Maria spoke of earlier there, and I won't elaborate on them. And then among the consumers, we have the ultimate consumers, which are the decision makers. But before science can get to them, we have brokers who integrate data and information and do analyses. And then we have advisors who take that and formulate it in a way that they can feed it to their decision makers. So that is a very um, important way of breaking down the process so that we can better understand it and better work with it. And a lot of this is elaborated in greater detail in that GCFI report that I spoke of. Uh, then there are the types of fora in which decision making takes place. And I see that my time is running out rapidly. And they range again in consistent with, with Maria's presentation from local all, um, to regional, from governmental to community based. Next slide. If we look at that at the regional level, we see here all the organizations that are involved in oceans, not all of them, in fact. Um, the, Tourism, shipping, oil and gas, and others are missing. Uh, these are the ones that are focused on marine environment and resources. And we have a very complex regional governance setup where some of these science policy processes take place within IGOs, 
or within clusters of IGOs falling under uh, organizations such as the CARICOM group, the SECA group, or the UN environment. So there are processes taking place within those. And we need to understand how these work, where the science comes and where it goes, and how to facilitate the flows and transparency. And on to the final slide. The key messages. Uh, as we move through the decade, I think, sorry, I lost my screen there for a moment. We need to be mindful of the diversity and complexity of these processes and, and actors in multi-level ocean governments, the providers, the brokers, the advisors, the decision makers, and understand that the processes build them and strengthen them and do so according to good governance principles such as transparency, accountability, and many others. And also to emphasize the importance of bi-directional communication, which Maria also mentioned, uh, so that you have feedback and really uh, co-development of the information. And the building of these processes and the capacity of brokers, advisors, decision makers, to me is as important as building the capacity to provide signs. So I'm a little over time, and I thank you very much, and end there. Thank you very much, uh, Robin. This, I appreciate that you gave us this great example from the CLMEA, and um, we will continue now with the presentation uh, directly, um, give me a second. Um, we will continue now with the next presentation, which is uh, provided by Silvia Chacon. And Silvia is a chair for the Caribbean EWS, and she will be presenting UNESCO IOC Intergovernmental Coordination Group for Tsunami Coastal Hazards Warning System, Caribbean EWS. And before we go to her talk, I would like you to see the, the results from the voting. And this is in relation to what is your experience with co-design. And we can see here that the largest number is um, medium experience to non-experience, followed by little and good and very few people with high. Thank you very much. So um, we welcome Silvia Chacon with her presentation. Thank you very much. Good morning, Elva. Good morning uh, to all the audience and panelists. Thank you very much for the invitation. Next, please. Uh, tsunamis are a present threat in the Caribbean region and in adjacent regions. And over the past 500 years, we have had more than 100 tsunamis kill over 4,000 people in our region. And those tsunamis were caused both by earthquake and volcano events. And even though the, the run-ups are not uh, as impressive as tsunamis in Japan or the Indian Ocean, our Caribbean Sea is quite small, having a tsunami travel time maximum of three hours. And this is why we need to work together and we need to be prepared for the next tsunami. Uh, next slide, please. We have participation in the Caribe AWS from 32 member states and 16 territories, including 16 small island developing states. All countries but one, I think all of them now, have designed their tsunami uh, warning focal point and tsunami national contact. And half of them have nominated a national tsunami warning center. As you can see, we have members and observers all the way from Canada to Brazil. And this is a, a quite a, a extensive um, coastline. Next, please. So, how do we uh, carry out our work? We have uh, can you? We have four uh, working groups on tsunami monitoring and detection systems, uh, tsunami hazard assessment, tsunami related services, preparedness, resilience, and readiness. And we have task teams on Caribe wave exercise, volcanic activities, tsunami ready, evacuation maps, implementation plan. And we have a group of experts on other coastal hazards. And the work of 
this, all these working groups, task teams, task teams and group of experts is interrelated with each other. And behind of all these, these titles, there are a lot of people committed working hardly on get the Caribbean region uh, prepared and uh, for tsunamis. We meet annually. We have a participation approximated between 15 and 20 member states plus observers. And at the sessions, uh, for, for day sessions, we have intra-session working groups. Fortunately, unfortunately, this year we were being able to uh, meet in person, but we have had virtual meetings and informative sessions. So what has been the process used to bring the group together was, well, that was before my time. The group came together after, please, next, next slide. After the 20, 2004 Indonesia tsunami, because the, it, it became obvious that the region needed to be prepared. We are a region having many small countries that have few or none experts on tsunamis. And then it was obvious that we needed to collaborate to be prepared. And the, the coordination group is based on existing structures like, like IOCARIB and the meteorological community that have enhanced the performance of the Caribe AWS. And we have people from diverse backgrounds committed. We have people from emergency management office. We have people from the military sector. We have people from the science sector. And this uh, wide spectrum of, of people uh, background has allowed us to do our work better. But in top of all that, the important is the motivation. Krista was a wonderful chair for the for for eight years, six years at the at the Caribbean AWS, and the people that was before her were successful in keeping the motivation of the of the member states high and, and making all this work possible. Next slide, please. Next slide. Okay, what challenges have we have experienced and how they were resolved? Next. Well, mostly underrepresentation of member states on our sessions, including, uh, we, we saw that including that um, traveling expenses of, of some very small member states, including those expenses in funding proposals for Tsunami Ready, but it hasn't been solved uh, completely because that when we do it in that way, it, it goes for one year maybe two, but then that's it. The year after that, member state doesn't have the funding to attend to the, to the sessions. Then another challenge we have is sea level station shortage. We have um, been doing strategic alliances uh, with some other um, organizations, and, but it's not yet solved completely. We still have gaps on sea level stations. We have limited human resources uh, being that we have very, very few experts on tsunamis in the region and we have been doing constant capacity building, but it still is not completely solved. And we have bathymetric gaps, important bathymetric gaps. We have been doing strategic alliances again with organizations like the Hydrographic Commission for Mesoamerica and the Caribbean, but again, it is not completely solved. Next, please. So what are the benefits to science and applications and data or station networks both in seismic and sea level have registered next are recording constantly next slide please and they have recorded earthquake tsunamis and storm surges so far you can see the the records of a tsunami in santa marta colombia in 2017 and the records of hurricanes uh, i don't remember it was irma or maria in anguilla and barbuda again in 2017. Next, please. We, with the few bathymetric data we have, we have been able to, well, actually we have been able to survey some bathymetric data to use that bathymetric data and other to perform tsunami modeling and obtain tsunami results that show, for example, the inundation area uh, expected for tsunamis. And that area can be used on spatial planning and on uh, tsunami inundation um, maps, so, sorry, tsunami evacuation maps and plans and procedures for the communities that want to be organized. Uh, next, please. We also uh, have published, next, please, next slide. 
uh, a bunch of posters and journals, papers, um, on the work we perform in the region from subgroups of the Caribe AWS, and that's actually also good contribution to science. Next, please. And the impact that science have had on public policy and behavioral change. Uh, we have started by characterizing the threat, defining possible tsunami sources. Next, modeling those tsunami sources. Next, and using that modeling to define, as I said before, inundation area and arrival times for tsunamis that can help the communities to get organized and to design public policies, uh, for example, where to where or where not to construct, perhaps, for example, a, a hospital or a school. Next, please. We have the program Tsunami Ready that works on getting communities ready for the next tsunamis, has a serial of guideline, guidelines that include plans and protocols that can that should be created or adapted for tsunamis that can contribute to territorial ordering and even recommend the building of uh, vertical evacuation facilities if needed. Uh, you can see a map of communities that or uh, member states that, that, that are already tsunami ready with STARS and the ones that are working on getting their tsunami ready recognition with DOTS. Next, please. We perform annually Caribbean wave exercises with a usually estimated participation of half a million people for 2019. And each country, uh, it was complete participation from all member states last year. Next slide, please. Fortunately, this year, because of the pandi pandemic situation we have, uh, we had a reducted number of people participating and it was mostly a communication test that it was carried on. So to finish, next please. I'm just gonna say we have plenty of work going on and plenty of work still to need to do. We work for the people and we rely on the people to, to do this work because none of the people uh, working within the Caribbean AWS is, is, uh, is hired uh, to do so. They are working within their national uh, infrastructure and sometimes they get paid for that back home or they give the time to work that on their, on their works, but sometimes they do it uh, as an additional unpaid work. So um, all the things we have done are thanks to the committed and motivated people. So thank you very much. Um, this has been a, a very fantastic part in which we had these two presentations and we were able to understand some of the challenges, some of the opportunities that co-design and co-produced and co-delivered science can provide for the region. These are two important case studies. Um, we have a couple of questions and, ans and, and we would like to see some of the answers. We will appreciate if you have still questions and comments please type them in into the question panel. You can also type them in because many of these have arrived through the chat um, board. So um, I will read some of these because they are in important and we would like to see what our panelists have to say. Um, Edeniel Trejos is, asks us, what are we doing in developing countries about industrial fishery, artisanal fishery, about pollution, about sea level change. He also adds in his question, another um, question, which is which concrete measurements could we uh, consider to mitigate the climate change and in consequence the sea level change if there are over 1000 million people that would be in danger? Robin and Sylvia. Do you have any response to that question? I, I can have a shot at the first part. Yes. Of what we're doing in developing countries. And I think my answer would be a lot of it would be based on the CLME Plus project, where the idea is to use the regional strategic plan to build coalitions and uh, strength among particularly the less developed countries to tackle these challenges. 
Uh, one of the things that we're doing, I'm not sure if it'll answer the question precisely, but one of the things we're doing is, or have done, is to develop a monitoring program for the strategic action program uh, based on what is called the Governance Effectiveness Assessment Framework. And I would say within the next several months, we should be able to see the baseline survey that will show us where we are with regard to these three major issues, fisheries, both small scale and commercial, pollution, and habitat degradation and biodiversity. In the first phase of the project, or the baseline is 2011 to 2015, and then we will want to move on to the first evaluation phase, which is 2016 to 2020. Uh, so that should be available, I and mean, it's not an answer to the question, but I think one of the first things in being able to answer the question is to do some monitoring so you know where you are and whether the needle is moving in the right direction at all. So I hope that helps. Thanks. Thank you, Robin. We have two additional questions, one coming from Paul Giordis from the Netherlands and Eric Correa from Mexico. Um, Paul Giordis asked, how is it proposed to deal with the wealth of existing but highly disorganized data and information and make that these are available to this process? Um, he considers that as one possible activity. And Eric Scoria's questions are related that he would be interested in submitting a research project in January 2021. And his questions are, what are the requirements for co-design and, and submit these projects if there is a guideline? if the projects must be submitted individually or institutional, or if they must be submitted multi-countries and large scale, and any contact for questions about the topic. Um, Sylvia or Robin, would you like to answer that? Any of these? Well, I think the second question is not necessary for us panelists, it's for people from Iowa who know about the process, but correct me if I'm wrong there, of, of doing these, these projects. Yeah. I hope yeah. that Cesar will jump in and, and, and give us an answer. Uh, and yeah. I, have I actually responded to that in written. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah I have provided the link to the other one. And on the first one from Paul Jurdis. Yeah. Yeah. The answer to that could take an hour, but it. it <laughs> There have been many attempts over the years to build databases, to harmonize data collection and so forth. And one of the attempts, again, under the CLB Plus project was to build a decentralized data system for both data and information on expertise and experts, uh, where it would take you to the data as it is. Um, and the, and the data would be maintained by the people who own it, not in a decentralized form. Again, not a satisfactory answer, but the best one I, I can come up with in terms of where we have been going. Uh, thank you, Robin. We have two additional questions, one coming from Gabi Mayorga, asking Sylvia if there is a process to integrate bathymetric data into, you, there, into the EWC data sets. And um, the other one comes from Yolanda Lopez, and she would like to provide um, proof of participation of this important talk. Um, I, I assume this is your talk, if there will be, a, it will be available. And if it would be possible to have a summary in Spanish to socialize it in her institution. Uh, okay, Elva, I think that the second question is mostly for you, the organizers of the session. Okay. Uh, okay. The question of uh, Gabi Majorga. Um, the thing is, we don't need to have the data centralized. We just need to the countries to have the data related to them directly. So when we said we have a bathymetric gap, we don't have like a central database where we storage, but we know that, for example, offshore Costa Rica, offshore Northern Caribbean coast of Costa Rica, there is no data at all. And if there is data available, of course, it might be belonging to the country. Some of the data may not be uh, useful, or maybe not be uh, open to share for some countries because of security concerns. But uh, we just want to make, we don't want to own all the data. We don't want to have all the data. We just want to make sure that the countries have the data they need to perform the modeling for their communities. So 
Uh, we know there there is some um, data belonging, for example, the U.S. Uh, territories. They have plenty of bathymetric data. U.K. as well. But I think, uh, yeah, of course, portal networks are required. We were working to trying to get like at least an inventory of data extent and not the data itself, but to know, okay, in this region, to make like a polygon in this region, there is this data that it was collected by this organization, has these uh, policies of use, and you can contact this person to have at least the inventory. So the, the, our working group on hazard assessment has been working on that. Thank, Thank you, you very and much. I will tell them yeah. to, to, to contact you. I see the email. Thank you Thank very you. much, uh, Sylvia. This is fantastic that you can put them in contact. Um, we have Frank Miller also wanting to contact Robin Mahan, and he would like to talk about marine biodiversity with you, Robin. So maybe you can get in direct contact with Frank. Um, we have um, Brenda Martinez who raised her hand. And uh, Brenda, due to the lack of time, could you please send us your question to the questions and answer? Um, site and we will be able to answer there your request. Uh, we have other questions and I will try and we will in group try to respond to all of them. Some of them were responded alive and I will continue now with our second part of the our third part of the meeting which is what are the capacity development training education and resource needs at regional level. This dialogue session is with panelists and participants, and I will be moderating it. And we will have um, four panelists, Emily Smale from the Geo Blue Planet, representing the strategic partnerships, Paola Sierra, coordinator from Ocean Teacher Global Academy, OTGA, RTCA, LA, Invermar, Colombia, in capacity building and literacy. We have Areli Anei Paredes, Chief, she is a Catedratica de Conacyt at the School of Sciences at UNAM. She is in Yucatan at the Parque Científico Tecnológico, Unidad Multidisciplinaria de Docencia e Investigación, and she is in ECOP. And we also have David Ortiz Mena, a multi-stakeholder hotel tourism initiative. He's also in, in ECOP. ECOP stands for Early Career Ocean Professionals. And he is the president of Hotel Association of Tulum, member of the Akumal Ecological Center Council, CAA, in the Public Administration Institute of the State of Quintana Roo. And what, the way we will proceed in this panel is we will have questions and we will have a dialogue with the four of them. And I will ask the four panelists if they can open the video, share their video, and be able to respond. And I will address the questions to them directly. So we will start according to the presentation with Emily and then ask David, what process can be used to bring the stakeholders together to define the actions? So Emily, I give you the floor. Thank you, Elba. In, in my role at GeoBlue Planet, I work as a broker. So in Robin's presentation, he discussed the different roles. And as a broker, I work a lot with the scientists as well as what is often called the end user type community. And one thing that we found is that working with the scientific community, a lot of times when they want to know how to work with stakeholders or to meet their needs, um, they request very specific requirements. So they want to know what the spatial temporal resolution of parameters are, what parameters are their primary um, priorities, and when um, we end up talking with uh, stakeholders, they, they often have, have no idea and, and don't know the scientific details. So one thing that has been more successful is to gather stakeholders who are working on a you know, specific area or topic um, and asking them what are their information challenges, what types of decisions do they need to make that they struggle with, and then take that back to the scientific community and have the scientists work in an innovative fashion to think of what types of data could be integrated and collected to help meet these user needs. I'll also add that it really needs to be an iterative process where you will um, work with the stakeholder and provide an, an initial suggestion and then work back and forth with them 
to develop the data set or information that is needed for this challenge. It does take a lot of time and effort, um, and I think that that's something that this community needs to, to realize and really become engaged in that um, the ongoing and dialogue and follow-up with stakeholders and different partners is really crucial and where a lot of projects end up failing. Um, so, so really coming in with an open mind and understanding what are the problems that stakeholders have and then working with them in an iterative process to develop solutions is uh, one way that you can help with these partnerships. Thank you, Emily. In your point of view, um, David, um, what do you think about this, um, uh, the process that can be used to bring the stakeholders together to define the actions from your point of view as part of the um, tourism and hotel industry? Thank you, Ova, of, of course, and good morning to all. Well, um, I think the private sector would invest uh, more if there were great, greater government transparency and um, efficiency. Um, just to give you an, an example of what we can do to bring stakeholders together is when governments have failed to offer a, a adequate solution, it has been possible for stakeholders to come together and, and provide uh, adequate solutions. For instance, in our region, uh, particularly in the Bay of Akumao, we were able in 2019 to provide public private funding for one kilometer of anti-sargassum barriers. Almost all stakeholders in the area decided to invest in this project and come up with a simple and cost efficient solution for deposing of the macroalgae. Um, the municipal, state, and federal governments, blinded by uh, complicated and expensive projects, were unable to offer viable solutions. I think another useful mechanism for bringing stakeholders together and to ensure long-term commitment is to create trust. Trusts as instruments that can set clear objectives and uh, also guarantee that the stakeholders are um, committed for, for long-term objectives. So um, in essence, I, I think uh, stakeholders should be, well, um, uh, also uh, participating with or without government participation, but do need to have appropriate mechanisms for this to, to happen and continue to have a long-term commitment. Thank you, Ova. Thank you, David. And um, I will ask Paula, what in your point of view are the main challenges that you foresee for the capacity development, the training, and in particular to foster this cooperation between disciplines and sectors. Uh, good morning. Thank you for uh, the question, Elsa. I'm using the translation. <laughs> Are you speaking in Spanish? Go okay. ahead and speak Spanish, no problem. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Eh, respecto a los desafíos que tenemos en la región para trabajar los temas eh, de desarrollo de capacidades, eh, pues principalmente tenemos el de identificar claramente los datos, la información y el tipo de entrenamiento que necesitamos. Eh, yo coordino el eh, Centro Regional de Entrenamiento para Latinoamérica y el Caribe de Ocean Teacher Global Academy y hemos visto que eh, en la región hay muchas necesidades eh, respecto a los temas que, que queremos eh, abordar. Sin embargo, también notamos que eh, múltiples personas se presentan a múltiples eh, cursos. Y eh, esto no está mal, pero a veces eh, las expectativas son diferentes. Entonces, creo que tenemos un reto importante en hacer una revolución educativa, no solamente en la educación no formal, sino también en la educación formal, y empezar a hacer de aquellas... Eh, habilidades o ciencias que consideramos blandas, eh, como lo que tiene que ver con la comunicación científica o lo que tiene que ver con eh, la um, alfabetización alrededor de los océanos, lo que hemos llamado en inglés ocean literacy, eh, de cómo abordarla en la región y cuáles deberían ser esos principales eh, temas. Eh, 
Afortunadamente la región cuenta con esto de centro regional de entrenamiento y puede también eh, verse que hay procesos en ese trabajo, eh, no solamente con los académicos, sino también con los tomadores de decisiones y con el sector privado, donde debemos enfocar entrenamientos específicos, donde deberíamos también poder documentar el cómo se hace y cuándo se hace dentro de las comunidades locales eh, los procesos y entonces lograr también a través de otros medios eh, como por ejemplo eh, los videos o en su propio lenguaje y traducido a nuestra eh, propia forma de, de ver las cosas desde eh, las ciencias oceánicas eh, para que le lleguemos a un público más amplio, para que tengamos eh, otras personas aquí trabajando. Y creo que hay otro tema que es muy importante para la región y es lograr diseñar e implementar eh, un reporte único y periódico del estado de los ambientes marinos y costeros y alrededor de esto comunicarlo a través de eh, diferentes medios. Tenemos en este momento la posibilidad de las redes sociales, pero también está todo el tema de eh, la inteligencia artificial, del de Big Data, que ahora es eh, crucial en estos procesos. Eh, creo que allí también tenemos unos retos importantes. Y respecto tal vez a alguna de las preguntas que hacían hace un rato sobre la información, creo que la, eh, la región está eh, involucrada en algo que se llama el Ocean Info Hub, que es el que pretende ser un, digamos, un eh, eh, conglomerado o, o un aglutinador de diferentes eh, tipos de información en la región sin que necesariamente estén depositados en un único sitio, sino de que diferentes sectores, diferentes eh, personas puedan accederlo. Eh, el otro reto importante, creería yo, es el tema de involucrar eh, a los jóvenes, pero también a la población más adulta, aquellos que creemos que, que ya están jubilados, pero que son personas que tienen un conocimiento enorme y que tienen tiempo hoy para dedicarlo a pensar en estas cosas que necesitamos. Y que unido a los jóvenes con ese dinamismo, esa motivación y esas ganas de hacer eh, nuevas cosas y con nuevas herramientas como diferentes eh, manejos de los datos o las redes sociales, podemos eh, involucrar esos dos conocimientos también unido al conocimiento académico y al conocimiento sectorial. Creo que usamos poco los espacios de los sectores, debemos salir un poco de los temas ambientales o de ciencia eh, básica para entrar a esos, eh, a esos espacios de, de ciencia aplicada. Así que yo dejaría como eh, tres frases claves, una revolución alrededor de la comunicación científica, una revolución educativa, no solamente desde lo formal, sino desde lo académico, involucrando eh, conocimiento tradicional, conocimiento científico y todas nuestras generaciones, desde los jóvenes hasta los más adultos, eh, y una revolución digital alrededor del uso eh, de los datos eh, propios para la región para producir un informe único y periódico eh, para el mundo. Gracias. Muchísimas gracias, Paula. Muy importante mensaje y sobre todo estos tres puntos que debemos considerar. Y le preguntaría yo a Areli, ella desde el punto de vista del estudio de las comunidades que está estudiando en Yucatán y desde su eh, experiencia, ¿ella también qué retos prevé y considera que debemos con, contemplar a través de la cooperación entre disciplinas, sectores y comunidades, incluyendo el conocimiento indígena y local? Gracias, Elba, por la invitación. Gracias a todos por estar escuchando esta, este, esta sesión. Eh, bueno, yo tengo experiencia en una comunidad pequeña en Yucatán, en, se llama en Puerto Yucateco, y hemos trabajado con grupos locales. Y e, iniciamos el proceso utilizando la metodología de investigación acción participativa, porque como investigadores nos habíamos dado cuenta que había varias problemáticas que necesitaban, necesitamos resolver para mejorar el bienestar de esas comunidades, como fecalismo al aire libre, eh, problemas de inundación, disminución de recurso pesquero, y estábamos entendiendo muy bien como investigadores esos problemas, pero no llegábamos a soluciones. Entonces empezamos un nuevo proceso de investigación acción participativa para tratar de dar solución con las comunidades. Ahora, ¿a qué nos enfrentamos? ¿Cuáles fueron los retos? Que también las comunidades locales tienen sus propias historias de trabajo, de codiseño, en donde han sido solamente utilizadas en el discurso para obtener financiamientos o han tenido también experiencias de paternalismo en donde están esperando que se les dé eh, un incentivo extra, por ejemplo, una despensa, eh, que haya algo. Entonces, 
la forma de trabajo de la investigación en acción participativa no, pues no pretende ese paternalismo, sino más bien este trabajo eh, horizontal, conjunto de resolución de problemas. Entonces nosotros iniciamos el proceso eh, para una resocialización en donde también mostremos nuestro compromiso real por la solución de problemas de las comunidades y que no veníamos solo con un discurso o para ser utilizados para obtener un financiamiento, que de verdad desde nuestros trabajos como investigadores, como académicos, tenemos el compromiso real de aportar a la solución. Entonces empezamos un proceso educativo en donde es importante trabajar conceptos como la importancia de la comunicación, de la participación. Veíamos que había mujeres, teníamos muchas mujeres, esposas de pescadores, fileteadoras de los, del pescado que, pues, que, que capturaban sus esposos, que al inicio pues, no, no daban su opinión, tenían muchas, muchas ideas que aportar, muchos conocimientos que aportar, pero no daban su opinión porque también tenían una historia de... De, de, de opresión como mujer, que no podían opinar, que desde la casa pues eran silenciadas. Entonces también es parte de los retos de ir trabajando en el empoderamiento de esos grupos en, eh, locales, grupos indígenas que tienen una riqueza enorme de conocimientos, que tienen una interacción continua con el recurso natural. Y a veces a mis estudiantes les digo, es como si estuvieran de trabajo de campo de manera permanente tienen observaciones precisas de temporadas, de procesos ecológicos, que muchas veces pues, no son reconocidos y solamente pues, son eh, en el discurso queda ¿no? esa integración, pero en realidad no. Entonces, el, el principal reto es empezar a, a, a también empoderar a estos grupos para que tengan una participación real, una participación activa en la toma de decisiones, en los procesos de gobernanza, en proponer. Recuerdo que una mujer me decía, después de un tiempo de participar, de, ella me decía, es que ahora me siento con ganas de participar, siento que puedo participar, y no como antes que me daba pena porque sentía que no era importante lo que iba a decir. Entonces, también el reto es de reconocer que desde nuestro estatus de académicos podemos sentirnos pues, superiores y no darnos cuenta. O podemos estar teniendo actitudes de comunicación no verbal que lleven a minimizar ciertos conocimientos en las poblaciones y no dejar que haya esta participación real y activa de las comunidades. Entonces yo creo que también es un proceso de reaprendizaje de análisis interno en la academia, de cuáles son nuestros procesos para tratar de promover esas, esos procesos en, reales de codiseño, en donde en verdad estemos dando oportunidad, estemos escuchando lo que las gentes en las comunidades quieren decir y que tienen sus propios indicadores de bienestar y que tienen sus propias formas de llamarle a los recursos naturales y que están dispuestos en un proceso honesto y en un marco de valores a colaborar con nosotros para solucionar infinidad de problemas que estamos atravesando en, en el Caribe y, en la, y también en la costa yucateca. Muchísimas gracias, Arely. Thank you, uh, Arely. And I would like to remind our audience that we have interpretation and, I will, and that you can access it directly in, on your panel at the bottom to the right. You go ahead and, and define whether you would like to listen if we are having Spanish speaking colleagues to listen it in English or vice versa. Um, I will continue with some of our questions and the questions that we were um, answering that were responded in Spanish is what are the challenges that we find in relation to uh, capacity development, training, education and resource needs at the regional level. So now I will move to two other questions that I think are very important in the region is how to promote increased private sector participation in ocean research and innovation processes. And I will ask Emily to start with that question with the respond and then uh, ask David to also give us a, a response to that question. Thank you, Alba. So in terms of industry development, I have had a lot of conversations with industry people who have recommended that the ocean science community needs to do a better job of 
making the case for what's in it for them to engage. So oftentimes these companies are small, they have very small budgets, and so attending meetings for the ocean science community is sometimes difficult for them. Um, so I think the scientific community needs to start doing more direct outreach and attending those meetings, and also working with industry partners to make sure that they're getting a benefit out of the partnership. Oftentimes they're looking at that from the standpoint of wanting to be able to sell their products or technologies and making sure that there is a, a clear path for success for the private companies to be in, engaged in these activities. I think that it really is crucial for what we're trying to do with the ocean decade, particularly in terms of developing cheaper technologies. That's one challenge that stakeholders often bring up, as well as having technology that is very difficult to maintain and working with industry to try to develop cheaper technologies that have less maintenance and are meeting end user needs is something that we can work to facilitate. Thank you, Emily. And I'll give now the, the microphone to Dave, David Ortiz. Um, and David, I will also addition to that because we just received the question from Alejandro Costa uh, in relation to the sector participation and the industry participation, how to promote increased private sector participation. Uh, he asks, that due to COVID-19, the tourist industry has been impacted and as a result revenues for tr from tourism dedicated to the conservation of natural resources such as the marine protected areas conservation have been impacted. What is the tourist and hotel industry doing to help the conservation of these important areas? So divide your question in two probably, and maybe from your point of view in the tourism, you can answer both. Thank you. Of course. Thank you, Ova. Well, first of all, and to try to answer how to promote increased private sector participation. Um, well, I think in, especially in our region, adequate oversight and government accountability would go a long way in increasing the participation of the private sector in ocean research and development of programs aimed towards the conservation of the ocean. I would even dare to suggest that many stakeholders would be willing to contribute or even pay an additional tax, if you will, if this meant greater funding for these projects. Sadly, in Mexico, the opposite is happening. The current government is extinguishing several federal trust, trusts that are created or were created to fund research and innovation. So this leaves most of the burden on the private sector and the research institutions. This would make strategic alliances between um, these sectors indispensable, in my opinion, for future su success of any initiative. So really, I think the private sector has to um, do all efforts to come up with alliances with investigative institutions. Now to try to uh, answer the second question, of course, COVID-19 has been very hard on the tourism sector. Um, and sadly to say, I, we, we expect it will continue to affect throughout um, the next calendar year. This of course leaves um, less resources, not only from the um, private sector, but also from taxes that are collected from this industry. Industry um, In Mexico, some, somewhere around 8% GDP has to do with tourism. So again, I think we have to do all the efforts to um, have strategic alliances direct from the uh, tourism sector and the hotel sector directly to promote uh, specific initiatives. I think that the, the better way to do this is with private trusts, because for the private sector, I've also seen that now that we have been hit hard, some companies are rolling back um, pledges that they had made previously. 
So I think it, it, it is also quite important that we can um, see this as a long-term solution, not only when there is available uh, income, but to try to keep this as, uh, as a long-term compromise. I hope I more or less uh, were, were able to answer the last question. Thank you very much, Elda. Thank you, David. And um, I'll continue with another question that we, that we received, which is what policy instruments are required to promote more inclusive gender, generation, geographical, and stakeholder and interdisciplinary science, technology, innovation, and settings? And I will ask Paula, Emily, and Arely to develop on this, please. Emily, if you would like to start. Uh, sure, thank you, Elva. So I, I think one thing that we need to look at is when we're trying to put together teams of people or hiring panels that we include diverse groups of people in those discussions. One thing that happens a lot is people tend to want to hire someone that has the same background or pedigree as them and understanding that people who have diverse backgrounds or may have not had the same opportunities to have the correct pedigree that is viewed by different stakeholders doesn't necessarily mean that they wouldn't be as good or, or better at a job. So I think keeping that in mind is, is very important and that there should be policies that make sure that um, the writing of position descriptions and, and policies are um, including that the diverse people should be involved in the initial phase of, of writing up these activities. Um, I think also just making sure that we encourage diversity in terms of giving people visibility. So making sure that you have diversity in um, panel presentations or different um, groups. And also, I think that we also need to make sure that we include um, younger people in, in the discussions. I think that that's something that um, often gets left out in the, the oceanography community where you, you see the same um, senior people representing um, different groups and in, in, in every meeting you go to. So I think that keeping those in mind in terms of uh, policies moving forward would really help increase the diversity. Okay, um, thank you. Uh, I will ask Paula if she would like to add something to this question. Eh, sí, Elba, muchas gracias. Me gustaría eh, comentar al respecto que es importante que las políticas públicas incluyan también eh, como una traducción, digámoslo así, de los resultados científicos para ponerlos en diferentes lenguajes, donde eh, todo ese grupo de, de actores que nos menciona Emily pueda realmente eh, ser ingresado desde el inicio eh, de los procesos eh, donde queremos que participen. Igualmente, desde el punto de vista de la promoción de la ciencia, está la ciencia ciudadana. Y poco nos fijamos en esa ciencia ciudadana. Yo creo que tenemos que hacer una apuesta en la región por esa ciencia ciudadana, donde cada una de esas personas que está en territorio, y como nos contaba Areli, eh, que pueden hacer la diferencia con sus propios conocimientos, que saben el cómo, cuándo y dónde eh, ocurren eh, los, los fenómenos, o cómo, cuándo y dónde se dan los servicios ecosistémicos que podemos hacer uso de ellos, puedan también ser, eh, ser involucrados. Yo creo que además para nosotros en la región del Caribe tenemos un reto y es que casi que podríamos tener unas eh, subregiones, si quisiéramos llamarlo así, y no por, por hacer eh, diferenciaciones eh, eh, únicamente geográficas, sino también en la forma como se abordan los procesos y esas políticas públicas deben contemplar esos procesos. Entonces tenemos un área insular magnífica con unos servicios ecosistémicos que son maravillosos hacia el turismo, eh, en los temas de pesca y de recibir, digamos, eh, algunos impactos que son diferentes a los que recibimos, por ejemplo, en Centroamérica o en el norte eh, de, de Sudamérica, donde tenemos procesos diferentes. Tenemos comunidades indígenas eh, que pueden compartir conocimientos perfectamente entre la zona centroamericana y la zona del norte de, eh, de Sudamérica y allí es muy, muy importante lograr tener como esa, eh, esa posibilidad de interlocución entre la ciencia, el conocimiento científico y el conocimiento eh, tradicional, pero también con las políticas públicas, porque las políticas a veces se diseñan desde las capitales de nuestros países y no desde el territorio. 
y en ese diseño de las políticas públicas en territorio es muy importante tener en cuenta el género, las generaciones, como lo mencionaba en, en, en mi intervención anterior, jóvenes y, y adultos, eh, la, la parte geográfica, como lo acabo de decir, y eh, por supuesto el sector privado. El sector privado juega un rol eh, muy importante en la región en diferentes partes y no solamente referido a pesca o turismo. Tenemos nuevas oportunidades desde el punto de vista del sector privado. En ciencia, como lo veíamos hace poco, hay eh, políticas relacionadas con el uso de algunos de estos recursos o de material genético que no han podido desarrollarse adecuadamente, como, como lo venimos trabajando en la Convención de Biodiversidad. Y sería muy importante que se pudiera hacer. Si vimos hace poco con un poliqueto marino lograron eh, extraer hemoglobina con la cual están trabajando temas en pacientes COVID en Francia. ¿Por qué no hacerlo en la región si tenemos la misma especie, por ejemplo? O también desde el punto de vista de eh, la cooperación entre comunidades y sector privado alrededor de los temas de carbono azul. En Colombia lo estamos haciendo y hemos logrado una alianza interesantísima entre eh, 14 comunidades locales de mangleros, pescadores y eh, el sector privado con, con eh, entidades que quieren hacer ese tema de responsabilidad social como eh, Apple y otras que están trabajando en estos procesos. Entonces, creo que hay que buscar esos otros puntos donde la industria y el sector privado también tienen sus propias políticas sectoriales, donde necesitamos que se enlacen con esta ciencia que queremos y hacer, eh, por supuesto, disponibles los datos, el poder de de la información está en que sea accesible, que sea entendible y que sea aplicable en todos los lenguajes y a todas nuestras poblaciones. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Paula. Y para cerrar, eh, le preguntaríamos a Areli su punto de vista desde el marco de las comunidades locales y de conocimiento tradicional. Y cerraríamos con una pequeña oración por parte de David para conocer también la visión del sector eh, industrial. Muchas gracias. Gracias, Elba. Yo creo que haría referencia a dos conceptos, política pública y política gu gubernamental. Y yo creo que lo que se está haciendo mayormente es política gubernamental. ¿A qué me refiero con esto? A que las políticas o los instrumentos que se diseñan, pues son elaborados desde el punto de vista de los políticos, de quienes toman decisiones en el gobierno sin incluir la opinión de académicos, de comunidades locales, de comunidades indígenas, en México a lo más que hemos podido llegar es, son estas consultas ciudadanas en donde podemos emitir el voto o donde en una plataforma podemos subir un resumen de nuestros resultados, pero no vemos la, la aplicación real, la apropiación real del uso del conocimiento. Entonces, en este sentido, pues veo que es más bien una política gubernamental que no llega a ser pública porque no estamos incluyendo de una manera efectiva estos resultados de investigación, estos conocimientos de, la, de las localidades. Entonces yo invitaría más bien a tratar de hacer política pública, una política pública real y no solamente quedarnos en política gubernamental. Muchas gracias, Areli. David, para cerrar. Thank you, Olva. Um, talking again about the greater challenges we face, I think we have to uh, take into an account from my point of view and uh, particular to our region, probably one of the issues that most concern us, concerns us is the adequate or the inadequate uh, waste management or correct disposition of sargasm or treatment of residual waters. And to close, I just want to emphasize that I don't think the main obstacle to overcome these problems is the implementation of financing. I believe most situations could be funded through national or international funds or institutions, but they seldom do because this would require local or municipal governments to acquire long-term commitments and be subject to greater oversight, plan for adequate return on investment, and in most cases, accept the involvement of the private sector. There are some legal mechanisms through which the government and private sector could participate together to tackle these pro problems, such as, for instance, public-private partnership and private concessions but governments often shy away 
from these instruments since this would oblige them to follow stricter guidelines and have greater accountability and planned for years beyond their term in office. So although we have been, there have been some individual efforts aimed towards uh, diminishing the impact on the oceans of the environment as a whole, I would say the greater barrier in our area is the local government do not offer well, well thought out solutions and seldom are held accountable for their actions or failure to provide adequate and sustainable services. That being said, I think the private sector cannot and should not be a passive, have a passive role in this issue. We should continue to put forth solutions and fund them whenever possible. But of course, these actions are many times hindered by the difficulty to form productive alliances with our local government. In order to design, implement, and re revise programs aimed to mitigate the impact of environment and work to towards sustainable future of the region, it is imperative we try to seek alliances with the local government. Thank you so Thank much, you, Elba. David. Thank you. I appreciate all the panelists for their great um, responses and answers to the questions. And I would like to introduce Lorna Innes, the Regional Coordinator in the UN Environmental Program, the Cartagena Convention Secretariat. She will present us the conclusions, recommendations, and the next steps. Thank you. Lorna, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much. Um, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. But first, let me apologize because my internet has been going in and out. Um, but I still think that we've had a, an excellent um, morning's discussion. And uh, we started the, um, the morning with, um, I, I think Arnulfo set the stage with his welcome remarks um, and really making the, a very strong link between the uh, between what we are doing, what we are trying to do in the region and the 2030 agenda. Um, <clears throat> and the, I, I, I liked Craig's, um, Craig McLean's um, summary of the objectives and outcomes of the decade, focusing very much on the impact of societies and people, as well as, and to me this is a key point as well, the, the immediate need for for us to inspire each other in this process, but also to be able to inspire the stakeholders and others who are joining us on this journey. Um, Krista reported on the global uh, co-design meeting and, the, and, um, and the, our own WTA workshop um, held in September, reminding us of the thematic areas, but very much that, that, um, that need to link what is required for the region to develop um, and not doing things in, in the very same way that we've done them before. The, the need for transformation, I would say, came out very, very strongly in those early uh, presentations. Um, I liked the case studies that we've had. Um, the, uh, Robin presented uh, I'm sorry, I missed um, one of the presentations. Um, Maria Concepcion, um, she, she uh, taught us a little bit, I would say. Um, I learned some things in her presentation this morning on this issue of co-design, co-produced and co-delivered um, science. And the fact that it's, it centers very much around people. Yes, um, requirements also, and making sure that the requirements of all are considered, but also integrating the various sectors uh, of persons in the, in the discussions, in the design, in the delivery, and the fact that in many ways, this is something that we do on an ongoing basis um, in our work, um, and, and just, but just to focus on it um, in this regard would really deliver what the ne what the decade needs to deliver. Um, I liked the the um, the uh, case studies that were that were presented as well. And Robin spoke about 
um, about the, the, the science and how did the science for the, the Caribbean large marine ecosystem was developed through the, a very iterative process um, and looking at what was needed for the region and ensuring that all the stakeholders were involved and all, and more importantly, um, linking all of the different levels of government governance across the region um, together in a network. And, and really that was the effort that, um, that the CLME uh, plus, uh, the CLME pro process was trying to do and um, successive projects have built on that. We've really learned through that process the benefits of working together and building a regional governance framework that is very useful to all the stakeholders involved. Um, and with respect to the issue of the science policy interface, and this, this is something we talk about quite a lot, and how it actually can impact behavior change um, by actually, by knowing very clearly where the science comes from and where it is going. And, and really this is, I, I think that this was a, a, a theme that was throughout the all of, um, all of the talks that we needed to be very clear about our, the actors and making sure that all the actors were included. So then um, the, 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 those different levels of governance um, focused on pathways really for engagement and we need to strengthen those processes. And then the, the, the issue of what, what Robin called bi-directional communications. And I think that that was very interesting. Um, I, I would go further than bi and, and say multi-directional communications because I think that, that the next, the other, um, the, the panel that we've just had also um, brought that out very clearly. And then we have the, the additional case study on the tsunami and coastal hazards early warning system for the Caribbean and adjacent regions. And the fact that there's such a wide, a, a, a really um, significant involvement and, and, and the early warning system intergovernmental inter coordination group is building and building on the involvement year on year um, not just from member states. We, we have heard about the underrepresentation of member states in meetings, but then when you look, when, when you hear the, um, the, the uh, history of, the, of how the, the numbers have gone up in terms of the exercises and the number of tsunami ready communities and the improved information for infrastructure development planning, um, and the, the actual events, hazards that have taken place that, um, that the, the system has been able to record and communications have gone out to all the stakeholders, then um, we can see these, these various levels of govern, governance, but also communications, uh, multi-directional communications working very well. Um, and then in, in the, in the, in the final, I, I also was tracking a number of the questions, trying to follow the questions as well. Um, someone mentioned that, that um, the, the, the importance of biological measurements. And, um, and I like the fact that even during the meeting, the importance of, of a meeting like this for just um, providing opportunities for networking. Um, you know, we heard of students talking about submitting a, pro, a, a project proposal and linking with um, Professor Mahan. Um, I think those, th those are very positive outcomes of a meeting like this that goes even above and beyond just the content of the meeting. And um, in this final um, panel that we've just had on capacity building and resource needs, we've been talking a lot about um, about formal and informal education needs, as well as the need for ocean literacy and having soft skills in terms of communication, use of social networks, empowering women at all levels because of the level of knowledge that they have, particularly those in indigenous, as well as small rural and coastal communities. And, and the fact that we need to be very careful that as that those of us perhaps on the 
scientific side that may be the source of um, of information would would not be giving nonverbal cues and attitudes that actually block the inclusion of those um, those groups that actually have indigenous knowledge. We need to really listen to communities. And that was one of the messages that came through quite strongly for, for me as well. And then the issue of promoting increased um, private sector participation and the fact that um, there's uh, we, we can encourage governments to have greater oversight in terms of, of funding to, for research and supporting research so that we are able to get private sector um, uh, partners on board. And we really need to put some effort into having these strategic alliances with the private sector. Um, the, the use of private trusts trust was also um, included. I also noted that um, a number of the speakers mentioned different age groups that we needed to engage with. And, and, and for me, that is very telling, the fact that really, because we are dealing with an intergenerational, um, intergenerational issue in terms of um, oceans and governance and conservation, whatever the oceans delivers as benefits to humans, that older people must be included, younger people must be included. Um, and, and then my final two comments, um, which I, I thought were also quite important, we need to focus on existing private, um, private sector policies so that we can then deliver the science to support those policies rather than trying to do everything and, and maybe trying to get policies changed. We look at what is existing and see how we can provide the science and the information to support those. And then um, utilizing also the policies that are, the, the policy needs that have already been identified to engage the public at, in a very meaningful way. Don't just um, make it a token engagement but really listen to what they have to say, make them an equal partner and utilize the, the science, whether it is indigenous knowledge or whether it is um, pure research, we really make it, we make it real public policy by in, in, in ensuring that we engage the public at a very, very high level. So um, those are, uh, unfortunately, as I said, um, my internet was in and out and I know that I missed some things. My, my sincere apologies to all and I'm very glad that this workshop has been recorded so you can go back and anything I have missed, my apologies to all. Thank you very much. Thank you, Lorna. I really appreciate your contribution with the summary. And hereby, because we are over the time, I would like to thank our participants and panelists the support team and the organizers for this virtual session to help contribute with the co-design, co-production and co-delivery for the region. We thank IOC, UNESCO, IOCARIB and the support of the government offices of Sweden for the support for this Ocean Decade virtual series. We look forward to seeing you join the decade contributing with transformative actions with long lasting benefits to the ocean and the society. And please, before you leave, answer the final poll that shows on your screen. Um, thank you very much. Uh, because this is recorded, will be recorded, you will be able to find it directly in um, the web page for the Ocean Decade. Thank you very much. So the voting will continue for at least another two or three minutes. Please feel free to answer uh, and vote. Uh, the questions are, um, how has your understanding on co-design evolved with this event? Which do you think is the biggest challenge for the co-design for a regional decade program that needs to be addressed? In which Western Tropical Atlantic Ocean Decade Working Group would you like to actively participate and engage in the design and implementation of proposals for the benefit of the ocean and society? We would like to hear from you and you can continue voting for at least another two or three minutes. Thank you. Para aquellos que no tuvieron tal vez en este momento ya la traducción, 
Los invito a que continúen votando. La pregunta es, ¿cómo incrementó su conocimiento en codiseño a lo largo de este evento? Eh, las preguntas van a estar todavía puestas por otros dos minutos. ¿Cuál es el reto o el desafío más importante para el codiseño en el programa de la década en la región y que debe ser considerado? Y la última pregunta, en este grupo de la década de los océanos para el Atlántico Occidental Tropical, ¿en qué grupo quisiera usted involucrarse y participar en el diseño y la implementación de propuestas en beneficio del océano y de la sociedad? Permanecen todavía un minuto y medio más y estamos viendo ya algunas de las respuestas. Pienso que muchos de los colegas aprendieron bastante sobre el codiseño a lo largo de este evento, algunos un poco más. Y el reto más importante que hasta el momento podemos detectar va vinculado a financiamiento y va vinculado a cómo integrarse con los grupos de multiactores. ¿Y en qué les gustaría participar más? Tenemos una gran diversidad de respuestas, pero tal vez la que más se nos refleja la participación es el océano resiliente y sano. So, um, so far our responses show that um, the groups that people would actively be participating and engage are the healthy and resilient ocean where marine ecosystems are understood, protected and restored, followed by a clean ocean and accessible ocean, followed by the safe ocean and changing with the responses still arriving and voting arriving. Um, the biggest challenge that has been identified by participants are, are, is funding on the one hand and identifying multi-stakeholder engagement and um, about understanding on co-design I think most people learned a lot during this workshop. Thank you for your participation. We'll probably close in half a minute and we have 80% of the voting. Thank you very much. Thank you for your participation and thank you for voting. Thank you for your kind and generous comments in the chat panel. Thank you, Alva, for wonderful facilitation of the meeting. Well chaired, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you to everybody and uh, uh, join you soon in the next uh, webinar of the uh, Ocean Series. Yep. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you for the panelists. Everybody did a good job and our IOC colleagues for coordinating and all the work. I think it was our first Zoom <laughs> at the, the IOC level. So that was, was a good practice. So, And thanks, everybody, for your participation. Bye-bye. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Bye. Bye.